<laughs> the wraparound yeah. things, the straps. Creepy old man vibes. <laughs> Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and I am back in the studio, finally in the air conditioning with a soundproof treated room and a good buddy of mine, Ian. How are you doing? Been a minute. <laughs> it's been since March. Has it? It's been since March. Yeah, with the exception of uh, was it Huckfest or Wheelie Fest? You joined me up on the sand dunes at UTV Takeover yeah. Oregon for uh, Wheelie Fest. Yeah. 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 yeah, so uh, it's been a it's been a hot minute since you've been in the studio. Yeah, um, how's life treating you? Uh, I've been living in Portland. It's been going pretty good. Um, you know, Portland as a whole. Uh, I'm not sure I have enough DUIs to live there. Um, I don't do cocaine. I'm surprised they you don't have enough in. tattoos or earrings no, or yeah. pronouns. Yeah, they. Um, it, it's a wild place, no question about <laughs> it. And uh, yeah, I've been down there for what we're in the eighth month, so like uh, I'd say about six months out of the year, and been going good. Just been crazy busy. So, so a lot's happened since uh, March. Mm-hmm. Um, not only you know in our lives, but also the industry, right? So, yeah. For sure. We've had all the manu- manufacturers kind of come out with their refreshes for 23. We've kind of had a bunch of events happen. Um, yeah, just a bunch of kind of interesting stuff and a lot of interesting uh, hiccups in the road as far as, you know, storylines go. So how, how was your how was your travels and how's your events been since uh, March? Not too bad. Not too bad. As you can tell, I'm a little rusty for this show. I didn't bring my Canon R5. So uh, <laughs> Zach's up there in the four, 4K Sony corndog machine there, and I'm up here on a GoPro. So <laughs> that's, why, that's why Zach looks amazing. I, I'm kind of thankful that I didn't bring my uh, my R5. I, I did uh, the Idaho trip a couple of weeks ago, and this is the actual hat that I wore. And if I brought that for my freaking uh, R5 monster, it would probably just expose and maybe look like a hobo <laughs> or something like that. But uh, yeah, it's it's been going good you know a lot of the shows that we've been doing it just seems like time flies by like i mean it's what it felt like the start of summer just happened like about two or three weeks ago and then blink and it's over uh we did less events this year which was actually good um dune fest went off pretty dang good takeover was brutal it was brutal i just uh just had machine troubles you know which a lot of people that attend that event run into situations like that and uh it kind of took me out by Thursday. And so let's talk a little bit about that. So everybody has heard kind of about the pro R or not the pro R the, the pro XP four seater that your company has as a show car. Uh, it's been built up with HCR and, and uh, some MTS springs and uh, some tuning and stuff like that. Uh, what was the initial issue with that? You got, you kind of reflashed that and then you flashed it back. Yeah, it's stock. It's been stock for this year. It, uh, we broke the uh, primary shaft and uh they couldn't pull it you know tried everything they could to try and pull that thing they had to tear so you broke the shaft or you broke the bolt broke the bolt i'm sorry yeah uh and that thing wasn't coming out and basically what happened is once that thing got torn down we also exposed a bunch of other problems that were about to go catastrophic so it's it's gotten a full rebuild um so did you guys replace the clutches on the pro or is that still yeah, stock? It's, it's all STM. You know, when they, that pro was actually subject to that initial recall they did. And we had a shoot not two weeks later and we were kind of up. You weren't able to get the primary replaced soon enough. Weren't able to get. Yeah, yeah for sure. And STM told me that there was no way they could, uh, well, I mean, initially they said there was no way that they could probably get me something in time for that destination Polaris shoot, but it showed up a day and a half later on my door. So that was, <laughs> thank so you. Shout out to <laughs> STM. Good yeah. job. Appreciate you guys for sure. Uh, but the, yeah, those STM clutches have been on there ever since. And, uh, it, you know, I've heard that that, that bolt is a sore spot for people and it's been, it's given people trouble in the past and the way that I drive that thing, you know, it's got 1600 miles on it and, it, uh, the way it's suspension is set up, it can hold so much pace that it's hard on it, you know, and, uh, just over time it just wore out and gave up and took me out of takeover. (laughs) So, uh, your, your car was there, both cars were there. So your X3 was there too. Uh, but your X3 had been freshly, uh, rebuilt and re-tinkered with 
by the boys over at Superior. What happened there? It, it had just some, <coughs> excuse me, had some unforeseen problems. It was electrical and it was on the third cylinder and we found out it was a pinched wire in the harness for injector number three. And anytime I turned left, it would cut out and go into limp mode. So in case you were wondering whether or not my car was a Republican or not, it refused to go left. <laughs> so, um, but it, uh, they identified it fairly quickly because obviously with, without being able to go out on the sand dunes and test it, we weren't looking for electrical problem. We were building a motor, right? And uh, takeover, it, uh, I got to a so, point where- So I, before we got the takeover, there was a bunch of stuff that went into it. Mm-hmm. So kind of give the rundown of what went into that motor because that's not the same like 3 r tune. I think we've talked a little bit about it, but uh, explain to what's in that motor. Uh, how long do you have? Um the motor on the, the bottom end and everything like that is all stock. Uh, we It's got like a Evo Plenum, Evo Turbo. Um, it's got treal exhaust all the way around. Uh, it's got um, KWI. Uh, what's, my brain's just not working today. It's like that <laughs> tap clutch. It's got upgraded injectors, fuel pump. It... Uh, it's running on E85, and it's kind of a Frankenstein because all the tuning on it is done by Whalen. And we figure, uh, we figure conservatively, it's about 300 horsepower to the wheels right now. Um, currently, it is, it is a Superior again, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure they're probably. It, it spends so much time at Superior, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Troy is going to deduct it on its t- on his taxes as a dependent. But it is. Uh, no, no big deal. They're just essentially prepping it for sand sport. It's it's ready to rock and roll. The only the only thing that wound up happening out at Dunefest was the uh, uh, the, well, waste, the wastegate actually. So you actually had uh, you had you were on a search for a tuner or something at first, right? Yeah, I was on the search because we had to log it and uh, nobody had because uh, you hadn't run it since the build. They needed to get the data to right to get, lock it down. Right, and we kind of figured it was running a little bit rich, but we had to log it. So uh, getting that getting that information sent over to Wayland so they could they could see how it was performing was tr- proven to be kind of a challenge and uh, we didn't get that we didn't get the tool until Thursday did a couple of logs on it and they didn't see any issues they were saying it was running a little bit fat but it wasn't anything to worry about which that's what you want to hear especially at like sea level and stuff but it uh, it um, we haven't done any sort of modifications to fuel delivery or anything like that the car's running actually really good but you know, superior in terms of the power adders and everything that they were going to do to it is done. You know, right now it's just kind of keeping it up for all the abuse that I put on it for 4,000 miles, you know, uh, so, so the, way, what, the way you control my wastegate right I was now. Say, so what wastegate, <clears throat> what happened to your wastegate? Well, the, the actuators, uh, broke off and is probably somewhere in the frame, but it, uh, it fell off. So now it is being held wide open by a piece of bailing wire and you control <laughs> it with your foot with a, you, you control it with the throttle. Like if you go into overboost or something like that, it'll kind of cut out a little bit. Like if you're going up an aggressive hill climb and then <laughs> it's, it's so funny, like it, it'll cut off a little bit and you let your foot out of it and it'll start accelerating. <laughs> so, but that part's on order and all that stuff's getting wrapped up. But like I said, it's there to, uh, uh, get just some body damage done, uh, cleaned up. Getting and, some body damage done, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> some so, rally in the parking lot. Yeah. It's getting some, um, it's getting some body damage addressed in conjunction with that wastegate actuator. And I think that's pretty much it from there. It's going to go into the booth. So, so what happened with that? Was it, you ran up some trees or something. What happened on the body damage on the body? What happened was I was jumping and, uh, sending it down some dunes, sending it off some dunes, sending it off some hitters and the entire hood assembly broke off. And, uh, when you drive down the highway and stuff, it just looks like a big freaking parachute blowing around. <laughs> and, you know, I don't think zip ties are very popular at Sandsport. So, so the, the, where the, where the holes go, where the torque screws go through the front of it yep. came loose, oh, yeah. broke off and, and was flopping around. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in terms of how many fasteners are on the front of a Can-Am, it's ridiculous compared <laughs> to a Polaris. Mine's probably missing 25% and I just chalk it up to weight savings. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a straight line, exactly. uh, 300 foot, uh, weight reduction that's right um but yeah there's i don't know what it is about can-am's front ends like it just seems like everything's a little bit just awkward with how it was engineered yeah it is dumb 
Yeah. Yeah. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. <laughs> I've had that thing. I've had that front end apart myself like three to four times and I just like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so that's got it getting addressed, and you'll have that car and your other. Are you gonna have both cars at Sancho or just no? Yours? Just the X3, the Pro staying up here. Um, the Pro needs some audio to get wrapped up on it, but uh, literally 20, 30 minutes ago, I actually got off the phone with the people that did rebuild the motor and and fix that uh, that bolt issue. And while I was out on the uh, Idaho run, the timing chain tensioner broke and failed. And that's pretty common in the pro. So you took the pro on the yeah. Idaho trip. Yep. And they just called me up to say, hey, all the parts are in. But, you know, it probably wouldn't be such a bad idea to change this timing chain out. And uh, that means we got to order a few more gaskets and tear into the motor a little bit. And I green lighted it. But yeah. that thing, honestly, that thing's about to get retired from the sand. Like I might leave it on dirt tires and uh, go play around in the sand a little bit, but I'm not going to do any aggressive doing with it. It is so unreal in the woods and out on those type of overland trips that I, I, I need to kind of cater it a little bit more to that and kind of make the creature comforts, uh, get it more organized. You know, next year where we're going, we're going to have to pack a saw. Um, I went into this trip, this Idaho trip, probably about 60% ready, which I trusted the machine enough to get the job done, and it did. So give a little wrapper to the Idaho trip and give people context to what you're talking about. So every year I, t I do a guided trip uh, somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. I invite, because we had such a good group, a lot of times it's the same people that went the year prior, and we'll have anywhere from about 12 up to about 18 cars follow us typically starts at about six to 700 miles and I'll guide them across, uh, through a trail system through the state of Idaho. Usually next year is going to be Washington. And this year, <clears throat> this year we had about 15 cars committed, but only 12 could make it. And we started just shy of the Canadian border and ran down to, I mean, if you're looking at a map, we ran down South of Pierce, Idaho, which is kind of parallel to like Missoula, Montana. So we're basically leaving the panhandle and going down into, you know, approaching like the low, low motorway. And we came back from there. So it wound up being somewhere around, it was a little shy of 500 and we were actually targeting somewhere close to six. And, um, just, you know, there were some rigs out there that had some struggles. You know, you do this long enough, you're going to expose some problems and stuff, but the pro, uh, the pro behaved, got the job done, but it is so perfect for that sort of stuff that I really want to spend some time over the next year dialing that thing into getting exactly what I want in my loadout and then getting some creature comfort stuff put in there like a fridge, like a Dometic fridge. Um, and then uh, the ability to pack a saw, uh, it has a roof rack that was built on it and that roof rack's got to go. Now I'm going to pull that thing off and uh, I should leave it up there and put some solar panels and stuff up there. You just can't, it's not a load bearing rack, which makes it well, useless. Well, I mean, solar panels, right? They're not very heavy. Well, the, what I have in mind actually, um, uh, is to scale back, you know, the big four seater has got a big roof. So I'm going to scale the rack back. So basically the, the actual rack where I can store some gear is going to cover what would be the two front seats. And then the back will be open. I mean, you know, they do they do flat panel solar stuff at about 50 to 80 watts. So, I mean, I could put something up there and, and make it a nice talking point, but also very functional. Yeah, there's a lot of <clears> options <throat> now with how big overlanding has gotten the truck scene and the band scene uh, to equip your vehicle with, with power. Yeah. Um, and I was actually having a debate the other day with somebody about which saw to take. Do you take the oil and gas saw or do you take an electric saw? with how, you know, some of these new brush brushless, you know, um, 24 volt and 40 volt saws are doing out on the woods. They're doing pretty good. Uh, but you still have to be able to charge them and have extra batteries and all that stuff. So, uh, we had, we kind of had a round round table on, on the benefits and, and cons of doing something like that. Um, I but. take a 26 inch bar Husqvarna, you know, the, uh, the Husqvarna, Husqvarna gun sight, uh, logo. The yep. three three prong uh, gun sight there, that's actually a tramp stamp I have on my back. <laughs> yeah, I'm a diehard Husqvarna guy, so I actually pack a two stroke. Yeah, so you think I'm joking? <laughs> so we we were just over at uh, Deviant Race Parts not too long ago. Uh, we posted some content on that, and they just started making uh, saw mounts for the yeah. cars. So. Uh, those are something to look at if you're interested in that market. Yeah, I have one. I have a saw mount in my kitchen that has yet to make it onto the Polaris yet. So I need to get that dialed in. 
Cool. Now somebody needs to make a freaking uh, 870 Remington 870 tactical mount for the RZR Pro. So uh, there's a few out there. I'm sure there are. I just haven't seen them lately. It just depends if you want an enclosed shell or if you want an exposed clamp system. Yeah. It, uh, when you go out into Idaho, we didn't have any incidents this year, but we, uh, you know, I ran into a moose, not literally run into a moose, but like spotted a moose. And it's not like I'm worried about bear, especially when we're kind of driving around in grizzly country. You know, those things will hear those motors and they'll run off. But moose, they're a-holes. <laughs> They know when you're coming and yeah. they like to see you head they don't care. down the sights. So, yeah. Um, so a little bit of uh, adventure there. You've been out riding around, having a good time. Everybody made it back. No real serious issues. It's just everybody, you know, kind of rallying through the woods and, and having a good time. Uh, and a lot of that trail was uh, the BDR trail, right? So if anybody wanted to kind of recreate any of point of that, they could legitimately just go look at the BDR maps and, and know exactly kind of where you guys were. Yeah, I took a lot of diversions off the BDR, but yeah, it is the main body of it. And one diversion that I took kind of shaved off about 20 miles on the way back home that uh, that timing chain tensioner was making a lot of noise. And when you hear problems in the upper part of the motor, it's never a very comforting feeling. So I wanted to take the shortest way back to my trailer I possibly could, shaved off about this 20 mile stretch. And the BDR will leave north off of the Coeur d'Alene River up through the mountains. But there's also another road um, that you can take that'll just go adjacent to the river. And I don't think I've been on a more beautiful drive in probably five, ten years. It was stellar. And all it did is just ran up the Coeur d'Alene River and right. then rejoined the BDR about 25 to 30 miles later. Well, there's definitely a reason why Idaho is the fastest growing, most desirable place to live now um, by a long measure by any report. So. Yeah, let's just put that out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so don't go to Idaho. It's horrible. It's ugly and full of smog and ugly people. So yeah, just don't show up. And it's gloomy. It doesn't even get warm until late July. <laughs> That's actually factual. <laughs> so uh, lots happened in our industry. I was taking a look at uh, when what's kind of been going through our news feed since the last time you were on the show. And I hear, hear BRP is doing well. Yeah, we'll get to that here in a second. Um, but uh, we had a number of different predictions and things like that. We had a couple of road trips. We went down to um, Sandsport or um, uh, I'm sorry, the Mint 400, which was a pretty exciting deal for me to kind of get out and adventure into something new and different for me. Um, you know, driving down the freeway into the mountains and taking the passenger wheel off of the car was also not what I considered a, fun, <laughs> a great part of the adventure, but yeah. we made it down there um, and, had, and had a good time seeing those guys race. It's a completely different experience. If, if you've never been to a desert race, um, yeah, that's a, that's kind of like going to Burning Man <laughs> of, of UTV of going to a desert race. Yeah. It's kind of what you make of it. Like it's not, a uh, traditional trade show uh -huh. and it's not the type of race it's not nascar where you're right on top of the track it's just one of those things where you watch half the action on a television that's somewhere close by and then all of a sudden the trucks start going through and you're like you who yeah ye, and then <laughs> there's then they're gone <laughs> there was an interesting part was that they have a vendor road down in the main area where you can go check out stuff and you could, really cool like histories where you can go through the whole history of the racing and and the mint um, establishment and everything and that was pretty cool and you can obviously get down and um, see all the racers in the trucks and everything they have a, a parade where they all park out on the racetrack you get to go down and look at the trucks and see, meet everybody and all that so that's all super cool uh, obviously the mint has the uh, the uh, the parade down um, uh, Las Vegas Boulevard or whatever that's called down there uh, so that's also crazy. And then that's the real trade show. Yeah. The, the little trade show at the, at the, uh, at the, race. the race events a little bit, just more of a, those that have to be there type thing. It's more a place where you can get beer. Yeah. And, yeah. and socialize and, and hobnob and all that stuff. So yeah, um, our buddy George actually got us into the VIP that, cause that, this is actually like the first road trip I ever did with, uh, my sweetheart. And, uh, we had an absolute blast and you know while we you know i'm running around taking pictures and stuff like that and networking and all of a sudden we run into george from um, the dirt life yeah from dirt life and he's like hey you want to get into vip i'm like well yeah <laughs> and uh he pulls us into vip and we just it was it was hot it was uncomfortable yep. and we were in the shade and we weren't going to move. <laughs> like, <laughs> I started taking all my photos and stuff like that from, from inside of VIP. And it was, uh, 
it was amazing. Thanks, George. <laughs> yeah, shout out to George. Uh, he, he's an awesome guy. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we went back back behind the scenes and got to see the production side of that and uh, hang out back there with all those cool guys. And I'm a nerd, so I was chatting it up with all the video guys and the audio guys and technical guys and all that stuff. So Celebrity trophy truck racer. <laughs> racer. <laughs> What kind of camera are you running? <laughs> yeah. Well, it was interesting because this is how much of a nerd I am. I was talking to the sound guy who mixes all the sound for their thing, for the live streams and stuff. And he's one of the main guys that runs like PGA audio. So when you watch the the PGA's tour on, on NBC or whatever, yeah. it's usually his fingers mo- moving the faders. Really? Yeah. So it was cool to hang out with him and, and meet him. Um, Did you get an autograph? You know, I got more than that. I got video. Oh, so yeah. Yeah, that's that's the currency these days. It's not signatures; it's selfies and and video. Yeah. So, um, but uh, so that was cool. But then we also went out and and traversed the desert and went into the racing the race course and learned a lot <laughs> of oh, what yeah. a Jeep uh, can't do stock. Um, I'll tell you what, it can't do much stock. So yeah, if you're looking for a Jeep, you put another thirty thousand into the suspension. Um, but uh yeah so the that went it was pretty cool um got back safely and all that jazz uh but in the industry we started seeing you know trends start to happen with uh, the events hap- coming forward we started seeing uh take over take shape we started seeing um some of the other auxiliary stuffs take shape and then everybody started coming out with their new models for 23 so um one of the bigger news items that we haven't talked about in a long time that everybody enjoys is our friend Robbie Gordon in Speed UTV. Yeah. Um, he just spent the better portion of a month or so over in China mm-hmm. uh, looking over the manufacturing process of the new Speed UTV cars and, and the engine development, you know, production lines and assembly lines and robot welders and all that stuff. Uh, and then uh, they t- somebody posted something uh, about Heisen showing off a Heisen version of the Speed UTV, uh, which... Reali- realistically was just kind of like a hodgepodge of speed UTV parts. So like the front was white, the back was orange, the suspension was blue. Like it was just kind of a mixed mag bag of parts laying around with the Heisen logo on the front. But uh, yeah, there was a lot of controversy about that, but uh, it really was just um, just the manufacturer that he partnered with to make this thing happen. Right. right. Um, and uh, they slapped their logo on it just for their press day on launching their new manufacturing facility down in Mexico. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know why that was such a big controversial thing. Yeah, I like, don't either. Like, it was a known thing for the last year and a half or something that Heisen was going to be doing the manufacturing part of that. The biggest takeaway for me is what we had heard, that people are going to start taking delivery on that car down at Sandsport. Yeah. It's a big deal. Yeah, so so Robbie had mentioned, uh, you know, quite a while ago that, you know, the first cars would probably be delivered right before or at Sandsport. Um, and so with the recent trips that he's taken over there to make sure everything's, you know, solid to what they want to ship, um, you know, if, if those parts are being made this last month and getting on the water this month, you would suspect that, you know, it's very possible that there's going to be cars ready to go, you know, by next month. Yeah. I, uh, I hope there's an opportunity as things start to roll out and stuff to, to drive one at some point, you know, I got some people that are very, very early in line that uh, have stated to me as soon as they take delivery, they're like, you got an open invite to come down and rip it. And I'm like, I cry a little and (laughs) get excited, but I'm telling you, like he builds this car that looks like an open desert dominator. You know, it's, it's built to go do a, go do that stuff. But I've crawled all over it multiple times and there isn't a machine I'm more comfortable in the cabin. Uh, the visibility is spectacular. The back seat's got some room and you can do some things back there. But then you give that, you put that freaking truck bed. bed in the back, man. <laughs> I mean, like, look, look at what I do. Like, when I take people out on a ride and stuff like that, when I go guide people, I mean... Think about all the stuff you put on your roof dude, and you the should sheet see and... the mess in my car by the end of a trip. <laughs> like there is just, it, it literally looks like a college dorm and having a bed to just keep that stuff tidy and organized in a performance machine. Cause the only thing that really have beds are all sport utility or utility. Right. And that's not the ride I want. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I look at Robbie's car and what's going to hold me back. Maybe it's width. Like, uh, there's some trails in Idaho that are like 50 inch trail. It doesn't stop me from going on them. Sorry. But like, uh, 
maybe some of those roadblocks or some of those barriers, the speed car might be too wide to go around it. I don't know. I know my pro is uh, 78 inches wide. Yeah, and, I, was gonna say, I think it's, it's not going to be much wider if so. any, than your pro. So. I wouldn't think so. I just, honestly, uh, there is nobody pulling for that to be the most dominant vehicle in the market than me just because it's like it, for what I want to do, it's perfect. And I was just saying to you, this, the, one of the cars that recently came out during the summer was the KRX4, mm-hmm. which I've been waiting for. Like, it, that's the car I've been kind we of secretly one. wanting one. We had one of those on the run. Yeah. It yeah was no, perfect. you did. Yeah. It was amazing. Which, uh, which magazine was it? Uh, it was UTV. Uh, well, he, he, he writes for Dirt Wheels and UTV Action. And the article okay. is going to be in Dirt, uh, UTV Action. And uh, yeah, great freaking machine. Yeah, no I mean, they're kind it. of a billy goat that can go anywhere. And everyone complains about the speed, but the speed isn't a factor. It's just the takeoff. Everyone complains that they don't take off as fast as a turbo or as a whatever. Yeah. But once you get to 60 miles an hour, my 60 miles an hour is the same as your 60 miles an hour. Right. And I don't have any complaints about that car. I notice that when people pull into the gas station, I'm on a turbo machine that's weighed down. And then there's a naturally aspirated KRX or KRX4 that's uh, weighed down. And they typically will use, and I'm not exaggerating here, they will typically use somewhere around any, between 18 to 25% more fuel than the turbo car. Right. And that just tells me it's geared differently. Gear, yeah, you know, it's, it's a lower gear and it weighs more. more. So right. you're just going to naturally have that problem. And, you know, for the most part, n- probably the assuming how I those guys were driving, they were probably not holding back very much. Uh, trying to drive the new car and get some new experience with it on the trail and everything. So yeah, it's possible. Um, you know, they they weren't light footed probably, and and like I said, gearing difference, totally different manufacturer. That's not necessarily like a, a high performance manufacturer as far as side by sides go. Um, but I was telling you, it's like you know, I really love that car, but I really want the speed bed on the back of it. <laughs> <laughs> like if they for if sure. they could just take the the Terex four bed or if they could take the speed bed and just put slap that on the back of the KRX four, I think that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, I, I you know, I've been on three adventures with the KRX four. You and I got to test them out. Um, very cool car. It's not uh, the four, the two. Or we yeah, we got to drive the two. But like I I still to this day maintain it's the easiest car in the industry to drive. Yeah, I, I still think it drives like a Cadillac. It's yeah, very it's smooth, very really kind is. of floaty, and and the power band's not jerky. And yeah, I only had like one complaint about it, and that's you can kind of you can feel its weight, you know, for sure in, in the in the handling dynamics, you can really feel its weight. The nice thing about the KRX though is that you can get a shock because the shock sizes were different than everybody else's at first, but the shock tuners have all caught up with that, so you can buy an MTS tune kit for it or whatever, and get those shocks performing correctly. And you can put a long travel on it from HDR or whatever. And so you can have a, a wider stance, a properly sprung stance, you know, and have the right valving and all that on the car. It would handle, I would, I would assume knowing my knowledge of all those tunes that it would handle like a dream once you got it all yeah. updated. Yeah. My, my girlfriend is completely addicted to sand dunes and speed and driving insanely aggressive. If it weren't for that, I'd have one. Like that's how good I think that car is. Like, uh, I didn't know how much I would enjoy rock crawling until a couple of trips down to sand hollow and if you've ever been to an event in sand hollow a utv event the krx's are freaking unreal down there and they're everywhere too like K- cowie does a, a nice little rollout and uh, test drive thing that they do at utv takeover in sand hollow and it is uh you watch those things go up stuff that's so freaking gnarly and it's no big deal i mean yeah. they're letting mom and dad drive up it and like no problem put your wheel right here all right light throttle goes right over it like a billy goat no problem yep. the the difference is a lot of guys you know they have these turbo cars or they have these big monster rock crawlers or whatever and they're used to kind of just throwing their car into it you know like throw it up and then just continue to the top Whereas like the KRX, you can basically just approach it, whatever it is, just it's in your way. You just approach it, crawl over it and you move on. Like it's not a big event like some of the other cars. Right. So uh, one of the changes that happened in one of the cars I got to drive uh, this summer was uh, we've driven the Honda Talon before, but we had driven the two seater and I got to drive the uh, Buggy Whips Media Talon, which is a four seater. Uh, So that was new for for me to to get that experience on that car. And, And once, and that car was a little bit, customize it has a removable steering wheel so the paddle shifters are gone and all that so it's actually buttons on the steering wheel instead of paddles and things like that but once you figure all that out the car was a ton of fun to drive and i remember on the podcast russell was talking about you know 
that car just being dependable and kind of reliable. Sure. You just throw it in the trailer. It's going to do what it needs to do every time and not have to worry about it. So that was cool to drive the four seater and, and to do it in the dunes even, which I've never driven a, a non CVT in the dunes before. So that was a new experience. Um, and I can definitely see the benefit of, you know, a sequential in the dunes, especially when you're doing faces and you have to hit the bottom at a certain speed and velocity and, the, and then get up the dune face at a different speed and velocity. And, um, sometimes being able to shift down and just throw that extra torque into it and get up the face that you want to, or into the spot that you want to, or the kicker that you want to, um, that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I've, I've drove that car a little bit and then we drove that two seater. It's, it's, I mean, it's just hard to describe it. It's infinitely different. Like the way that it handles, the way that the ergos are set up in the cab, there is nothing like the Honda, in my opinion, out there. And it, I definitely want to try. Um, uh, God, why am I forgetting his name now? I'm so bad with names. Uh, Pro Eagle, Chuck from Pro Eagle. His is turboed and fully suspended and everything, so it's it's all upgraded um, cage and everything else along with that. Uh, and that car, you know, from what I've seen, completely just tears up the dunes. So I, 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 I'd like to see the difference between, you know, the normal quote unquote ta- Honda four seater versus a fully, um, force induction and all that for sure. Um, so, uh, we had, uh, some interesting things happen this year. Uh, our buddies over at, uh, Southern gap, uh, over in Virginia where we did take over last year, this year takeover didn't go there. They threw their own event and, uh, that kind of went off uh, pretty awesome from what I saw. Lots of people turned out and had a good time in the mud and, and riding the trails out there. Um, can am patents we put out. <clears throat> Suspension pat- patents about uh, upright spindles and, and possible power plants and things like that. As a can am owner, uh, any of that tickle your interest? Uh, I saw those and it came out at a time where we allowed ourselves to have hope. <laughs> And then they made their announcements and it yep. was. Wah, wah. <laughs> so the, the Canon patents and the suspension that they had shown showed a more upright spindle option. Um, and uh, when the patents come out, they don't, they've already been applied for, for like a year and a half or whatever going through the system. And then they eventually they get issued. So that's been around and applied for, for a long time. So a lot of times you'll have patents come to fruition right when they go into production. Uh, but something so major like this doesn't go into production real quick. And so, um, and a lot of times something so complicated and specific as this is a lot of times just a race patent, like just protecting their, their equity and in, in their R and D department for the race teams. Um, and so one thing that we haven't addressed on the podcast yet is all the comments around, uh, that spindle wrapping around the top of the tire, which was a big deal for a lot of people saying that's the stupidest design I've ever seen. You can't upgrade to big tires, right? Well, I have a theory on that. That's that design because the patent shows both versions where it's like an inner upright that doesn't wrap around and a, and a wrap around version. Um, there is variations on the same idea and that's why they patented it. So what I would say is if it does go to production, I would assume that the uprights that do not wrap around are what actually go into production. And the ones that do wrap around are race equipment that can um, be limited to short course drivers. So everybody's talking about, about big tires and big, you know, whatever in, interference issues. I don't think that's going to be the general public version of it. I think it's going to be a, s- a simple upright one. And I think that the wraparound version is going to be specifically for small tire short course racing. You know, when you go down the rabbit hole on this stuff, um, it reminds me of this scene in the office where, uh, <laughs> where Pam is kind of giving the whole spiel about this chick that she wants Michael to date. So she, (laughs) she just sells him hard and Michael is crying and just goes, is she hot? (laughs) That's all I care about. Like Zach will go off on this tangent about these patents. Mind you, he's the only guy that's surfing these pat these, uh, it's like nerds assemble. Like, uh, (laughs) he's, uh, the only one going down the rabbit hole and going finding the, these patents and stuff. And then he'll talk about what he thinks, talk about what he's seeing. And I'm like, Michael over here, like, does it go fast? Is it fast? (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's the whole point Yeah, is that these, these spindles will get these cars running super fast. If it, it, cause all that suspension adjustment that you would have out of that and, and 
being able to keep the toe under control and keep the camber under control. And You'd better be right. It's It would be just so cool. Yeah, I, I just hope in like a couple of years or something, because what I've done to the X3 was to buy myself 18 to 24 months before I sold it. And hopefully I got a really rad decision to make when that comes, <laughs> where there's like three machines where you're just like, holy crap, got to pay attention to that. Yeah. And, and I'm hoping speed's one of them, man. Yeah. I and really I, do. I think that there there has to be, you know, Polaris and Can Am and, and and the guys that are focused on performance cars, unlike Honda and Kawasaki and those guys, uh, their roadmaps got to include some major engine revamp, revamps and some major suspension revamps to keep things moving forward. Oh, speaking of moving forward, man, I mean the latest YXE announcement just shook me. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, I mean, if you're into UTV, that should have just really just thrown you off a cliff. How Literally. many years? Will Yamaha get away with no product updates? I mean, the R Max arguably was a it's great awesome. was a great car For to sure. come out, but no, I mean, 2016 was why it came out, right? And it hasn't. It literally has not changed since then. Yeah, what did they do? 15 percent gear reduction. Uh, did they go from 28s to 29s? Some models have 30s. Yeah, so the Radiator, XTRs will come out with 30s yeah, and, and all that stuff. Cage redesign, radiated relocation. I mean, they've been around in sports shift since 2017, so that right. was right after the first incarnation of it. It's like, dude, everybody in the world knows how capable that company is from yep. an engineering standpoint. It's like, could you at least try? <laughs> yeah. So it's like it's like that meme with the guy poking a stick at something that says do do stuff. <laughs> do stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, you know, so we've seen Can Am or parent company BRP come out with you know high horsepower wave runners or, or skidoos. Sorry, not wave runners. Um, and so there's always the rumor about is this motor going to be the next power plant in the Can Ams? Um, and obviously, there's some bit major differences between a water motor and a dirt motor, right? But uh, it just shows that their engineering team has the capability of putting out those motors that we all want. It's just a matter of when. Dude, they're all French Canadians, man. It's just a bunch of freaking French drunks up or Canadian drunks up there just be like, no more. <laughs> yeah. Hey, sorry, guys. We'll, we'll come out with it eventually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so from what I've heard, you know, obviously the pandemic had a huge part of this delay and and whatnot. But uh, uh, from what I... Are really going to pretend like Yamaha would have done anything different if it weren't for the pandemic? Oh, I moved on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. so for that's what probably I've, their excuse. <laughs> so what I've heard is, you know, that we can look forward to a late 2023 announcement of some sort that then leads into a 24 model release. But, um, you know, that's that's all going to come down to what the economy does over the next eight months. That's a real thing, man. Yeah. You talk to any manufacturer, and I'm not talking to the machines. I'm talking about the aftermarket support. Everybody's worried about how down it is. Yeah. You know, I, I work in an industry. We are we are not we are not feeling that because we offer uh, a deep cycle battery as well. I mean, we've got multiple avenues to move that. But I mean, the people that make support products in the industry, uh, they're they're noticing a little downturn. And uh, I think I think there's a number of factors to it. But I mean. As new machines are available, people are going to be spending money to upgrade them. I right. think that's a contributing factor. Well, I think that the the major concern that they have is inventory and how much they want to invest, right? When a when an OE like Polaris or Can-Am looks at inventory levels, they're looking at how many thousands of units, how many thousands of you know spare parts, and however many thousands of what X, Y, and Z that they have to buy and produce and ship and deliver and allocate. And, you know, there's a lot of allocate or logistics that go into just simply saying, we're going to update, you know, whatever with a new hood or something like just one little piece makes a huge change in their logistics chain. Right. So making a major change where you're changing suspension or you're changing the motor or you're changing the, the transmission or, or any of it um, just amplifies that investment on their side. And it, you know, as a major company, you're not going to be prone to make those investments if the if the economy is not supporting it. Right, right. So hopefully, uh, you know, going into the we end need of, microchips. <laughs> so going into next year, I think uh, we're we're going to be looking forward to some major announcements. My thing is that uh, we recently found out that Camp Razor is happening. Right, that that hasn't happened since 2019. 
Um, and uh, super stoked that Polaris is putting money out, out into the community again and, and doing these events. Um, and something that I didn't realize until today when I was looking at their website, uh, I was looking back at the fact that you know their 23 model release didn't have much of anything outside of the Pro R Turbo R stuff uh, that was notable. Like there was barely any color changes, and the XP line had literally no changes outside of maybe some stickers. Um, but I didn't realize that the XP Turbo is gone. Yeah, like it's not even on their website. Right. Like it's not even a 23 model. How did I know that and not you? Well, I didn't. I just didn't think about it. Like I just, we were so focused it's a on foregone the foregone conclusion. We're so focused on the pro chassis that you know no one's really looking at the XP line, except for the guys that just want the naturally aspirated cars. Speaking of that chassis, uh, one of the last podcasts we did is what what to buy, right? And what was yours? It was My, a, it was a, it was the new chassis Pro Turbo. It was the turbo or the. Yeah, Pro Turbo. Yeah. So Daddy got to drive one of those at, at Takeover. A Turbo? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So what? What did that? So sick. Was it a two or a four? It's a two. Yeah. I think I'm gonna be seen on a four on sand. Come on now. You have a Pro XP four. Yeah. That I only <laughs> dr- that I only drive when my X3 is clapped. <laughs> <laughs> so so well, it was just a stock Turbo four. Stock Turbo four. But it was loaded to the gilt. You know we've. Uh, Man, do those things have Baja mode? They have all the mode. Uh, yeah, because they have the live, um, the new shocks and everything. I don't think this one had that. I think I just ran it like a super aggressive, like a race mode or something like that. Because I think the Pro R is the only one that has Baja mode. You're right. Yeah. Now that I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. So here's how my no. Luck. So the, the the Pro R has the drive modes, which then affect yes. all the suspension. Right. The, the turbo does not have those settings. It doesn't have like bond. it has dynamics and all that. Right. Right. So I sign up. We go up there and oh, you drove the the demo unit. Yeah. Oh. And, and I couldn't get a Pro R. One wasn't available, and so I get into the turbo and um, my sweetie's with me, and we go out for a rip. And I'm explaining to the dudes at Polaris. I'm like, let me ride in the very back. I'm going to give the group as much room as humanly possible, and then I'm going to reel them in, and I'm going to keep doing that because there's certain things I want to see if this thing can do because we want to buy something here very soon. And I was on that thing so hard, the guy came back. He goes, I need you to just back off like maybe about 20%. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, right, Karen. But we get back, and I started chatting them up, and they're about ready to leave for their next ride, and a bunch of people didn't show up. Well, it was my girlfriend's turn to drive, and she was going to drive the same car I drove, but I literally look over. I'm like, uh, hey, boss, that Pro R isn't spoken for, is it? And she, he goes, no. I go, honey, get out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> so we go over there and she hops in and she drove that thing. And we had it in Baja mode the entire time. And I was telling her to do the same thing I did and just let him go. Because here's the thing, like my girlfriend, uh, she drives like I do not even kidding. She won't do it if she's leading because like eyesight and stuff and the ability to read sand is kind of a, it's either you just full it's sand. a thing. It's a thing for sure. Yeah. And I've never had problems guiding out on sand. And, but when she can see what's going on ahead of her, you can go as fast as you want and she will hold your pace. And that worries the crap out of me. <laughs> it really does. And it, so I'm thinking to myself, I need to find a machine that could tolerate a mistake. And the Pro R is holy crap forgiving. Yeah. Oh my God. Like I was literally, I was with her. I go, give her space, give him space, give him space. And, and you, you can find Razorbacks in Coos Bay that are only about three feet tall. Right. Maybe even two feet tall. Well, in my X3, I launch them. I just, yeah, no, I just, those are just called fun. Exactly. And I was telling her uh, a couple of times, I've got to y- scream over the motor. You know, I was just yelling, just like, okay, no, don't go around it. Go off of it. And she would fricking launch this thing and skate this thing. And I'm going, this is the perfect car for her. Like this is, this thing is so much safer than what she's driving. And as much work has been done to my X3 that I think a stock pro R is just as safe. Throw a cage on it and it's ready to rock and roll. I mean, it's such a big car. It's wide. It's planted. Like you got to work for it to make and a mistake even the cage, on that We've thing. seen that it's not a chintzy cage. I no. mean, it's still kind of thin wall metal, 
or wall metal. <laughs> it's, it's still kind of still kind of thin. At metal. least you didn't say muffler tubing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it's it's still engineered way better than yeah. the previous models, yeah. and so the Turbo R doesn't have necessarily all those upgrades, but it does have that new suspension. Did you feel any differences between the two, and you know, versus your other cars? Oh yeah, yeah. The Baja mode is just. Like <laughs> it's it's unreal. <laughs> I, I literally was just doing the math in my head what it would take to get into one within the next 60 days after I drove that thing. I, I cause here's the thing. Uh, she's been wanting an X three since day one. That's what she knows. It's what she's driven. She, dr- she's driven mine. That's she, what all her friends drive. Yeah, and and she loves mine. And I was just telling her, I'm like, babe, you got to drive this pro R like, cause I, I, cause she has a it, XP turbo. Yeah. Like here's one of the perks of being in media. Like, I was at Coos Bay, not to toot my own horn or anything like that, but like we were in Coos Bay and uh, this dude shows up with a Pro R and he knew who I was. And I go, well, how do you like that car, man? I mean, is this one of your first times out? He goes, no, I've been out a couple of times, love the car, this, that, and the other. I go, look, I really want my girlfriend to love that thing. Will you take it for a spin? So he just disappeared for about five minutes and came back and she's just like, oh, I hated it. I hated it. I'm like, because if you've driven it, it's loud. Like right. it's a very loud motor. And when she told me she hated it, I'm like, well, that's because she wasn't driving, you know? And sure as heck, we got to get, go out to Coos. She got to take it for a spin and she's going about it. She's like, that is amazing. And yeah. I want one and get it for me now. So so, <laughs> so what would you call the differences between the Turbo and the Pro as far as how it handles? Um, as far as how it handles, honestly, I felt like the Pro R, um, I've driven the Pro R a couple of times now. I feel like it's it's very subtle. I think the Baja mode really makes a difference on some of those drops, some of those big hits and stuff. Like you'll feel it a little bit more, which, you know, but kudos to Polaris on that Baja mode, but in a heavier car, when you drop a Razorback and it lands planted and you don't feel anything, you don't G out, you don't do anything. Um, but you do on the lighter car. It just makes me wish that turbo had Baja mode and stuff like that too. (laughs) Um, the way that the pro R picks up power, um, is really impressive. You know, I think from a horsepower number standpoint, they're relatively similar. Um, you would think, no, they're not even close. Really? What, what's the, the turbo is still the 181 claimed yeah. horsepower in the in the pro is 225 well you know and the pro is probably gonna you know depending on how i mean you but your performance you, per pound and all right, that stuff right and that that's all a factor so but despite the fact that you're driving a bigger heavier car in the pro r it doesn't feel slow at all right. like it's it's actually really really impressive but um in terms of the handling characteristics they're both on they're both insane like i was skating those dunes it almost made me wanted to drive dunes with dirt tires it's that fun. Like, what do you need traction for when you can just drift all over the place and just have a blast? Like, right. I, I legitimately... Uh, and then to, jump on trail and then exactly. go back into the dirt. So so I was just running CST paddles on the Pro and uh, on our, our company Pro, and I had four people in the car and the industry ride started three quarters of the way back and finished behind the guy that was guiding it, like right behind him. And that's just because it's not a fast car at all, especially with four people in it. It will just hold so much pace. And the Pro R does that in its sleep. Like the Pro R can hold so much, so much pace on dirt tires that I was literally, literally t- telling Taylor from Amped Off Road, I probably could start at the back, you know, halfway back on the night ride on dirt tires on a stock Pro R mm-hmm. and just destroy the field. Yep. Just you know, not even get past. Like you can hold so much speed in that car. So, Wil- Wilkie, even, you know, I had four people in the Pro. And, uh, we did one night and he was the only dude that passed me. <laughs> like, like as soon as he passed me, I'm like, Oh, I'm getting him back for in his, sure in his pro R. Yeah. But I couldn't, I couldn't accelerate with him, you know, right. with that many people in the car, forget it. Like we yeah. got into an open stretch, he was gone. But yeah. once we started going through the twisties and anything technical, you know, we, we held our, held our pace really well, but, uh, the pro R is insane. If you ever had a doubt about it, don't. It's freaking unreal. <laughs> yeah. I just think that there's so much value. I don't know what the price difference is between one that is loaded out with that Baja mode and a base model. I don't care what it is. It could be five to six grand. I'm paying that extra five to six grand for those right. suspension features. It's so freaking good. Yeah. The the people always complain about the price. Obviously, they're an expensive car. They're an expensive category of car. Um, but the technology really does play a huge role in the purchase of a car. And that's why I've always complained so much about Can-Am being so far behind on technology. They've made up for it in horsepower, 
they've always had that at that kind of feather in their cap, but they really need to start playing ball on the technology side because that's not only going to improve their product, it's going to improve the number of people that want to buy into it. So the the ride command ECU system combination of all the sensors and, and dynamics and, and the live valve stuff with Fox and all that stuff. Um, you know, they have their can has their smart shocks now, and, and that's been kind of improved on over the last year or two that they've had that, but it doesn't do the, exactly the same thing as the pro R does with all those modes, right? You can't tell it that this is a style of riding that I'm going to be doing. Yeah. And I want you to perform and handle that in the, with those types of characteristics. Yeah. Let's just put it this way. If I, if I've got thousands upon thousands of dollars into my suspension and it's beautiful, but it's also set up the way that I like it. It's set up the way that I ride my dirt bikes, which is super rigid. You know, you get, you're going to have to back it off to keep your body from taking some abuse. The way that that pro R works, I can drive the way that I drive and have such a smoother ride. And I, I started thinking about it. I'm going, a car like that might keep me relevant and fast in this hobby for an additional five years after my prime. Like it's that, it's it's just not abusive on the body. Well, that's, you know, it kind of is like the difference between a non-smart shock or non-dynamics shock. With a, with a straight analog shock, you have to get out and make your adjustments. You have to know what adjustments you want to make and you how they like work, and, <laughs> and 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 like mine, like we just get a shock job on ours, but it's still a manual process. If you go from that to like um, you know the IQS system and add on the the controller to it, or you go to a dynamic system, or I'm sorry, let's just go to the the controller, the IQS. You basically just have now three settings: you have plush, med- medium, and firm, and you can switch on the fly. Um, and it just saves you the process of getting out of the car and going to all four corners. You go to a dynamic system, you're improving your ride quality by exponentiating all your options and all your configurations and the computer is taking care of all of it for you. You throw on top of that one more expon- exponent of these riding modes where it's actually deciding how it's going to handle the input that it's getting from the sensors depending on what you select. Yeah. Um, and changing the ride height. It liter- literally changes the ride height depending on which mode you're in. Um, and it changes at what RPMs it's going to do certain things and it's going to change when it's going to get stiff and hard and soft and all that stuff. It's a completely different car. It's not even the same thing as driving a stock base model. Like if you get a base model Pro R with the Walker Evans, or I shouldn't say that because they all have stuff on them well no they're not electric if you get that one it's a different car yeah i feel like you're about to attack my car well (laughs) if you get the base model car without the dynamics or without the smart shocks or whatever it's a completely different car than one that has it and if you get one that has these ride these ride command modes these bajas and these rock crawling and all these other things uh it one more time is a completely different car it's almost like that 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 model trim is a completely different model in in my opinion. And so if you are looking at buying one of these cars, if you're looking at investing into kind of like what you were saying is, is investing into how long can you keep it before you want to sell it, you know, paying the extra five, six, 10 grand for that top tier model that has all that suspension technology in it. Um, I can see people, you know, throwing a few extra uh, bones at the shocks and, uh, you know, the springs and stuff, and then having that car for the next five plus years. Why wouldn't you? For sure. Yeah, no question about it. I think it's that capable, you know, and the, it just, you know, I, well, we don't talk about this too often, but like my favorite car prior to the Pro R coming out, my favorite car to drive was a Turbo S. Like the, the way that it gave you feedback, the way that it fought, yeah, it was just fun. Like I would drive that thing and just be grinning ear to ear the whole time. The X3 was, in my opinion, the best car for my driving style. Like everything that I did got easier on the X3. It didn't have the feedback. It just barreled through stuff. The Pro R is now the funnest machine by far. Shut it down. <laughs> like, <laughs> like somebody else is going to have to come out with a freaking juggernaut to, uh, to really kind of displace my theory in that regard. And I hope they do believe me. But right now that Pro R is so dang fun. Yeah. And once the aftermarket caps ca- catches up to it, not, l- let's just put it this way, dude. The the Pro R is so good that it's ta- it's changed everything about what I think I'll do with my next car. Like with this X3, I've gone crazy on horsepower. 
I also built, you know, this, the car is surrounded by a lot of really, really tough components, but, uh, I don't even want to do that on my next car. Like they're all, they're all already very quick. So I could just see doing maybe like a flash and exhaust. And then every dime I spend after that's on suspension. Yeah. Cause what good is, what good is all that power if you can't lay it down, you know? Yep. And, and there's a big, there's a, there's something to be said for being able, there's a lot of guys that buy these pro R's now that are saying, I run this thing in comfort mode the entire time. You know, I'm in Baja and comfort mode. And then if it gets, if it, things get gnarly, I just push the panic button. Yeah. You know what I mean? For sure. And so they're able to have the smoothest, plushest ride and experience in their car possible. And then when things get gnarly, they're able to compensate for it. Yeah. So I, I think that's a huge deal. The other people need to step up, man. <laughs> and that's why I'm saying like Cam really has to start investing in that technology yeah. side of this because smart shocks on its own is a great option, but it's not the thing that beats them in their technology race. Right. So, yeah. So how was takeover for you in Oregon? Uh, Besides the cars. <laughs> brutal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you use the reference of burning man and that's what that event is for me, you know, and uh, you get, you get sucked into it. You have fun with it. It's just, it, it's so much going on. It, uh, it, I just, I had a rough week, you know, when you put all your eggs in those baskets that your machines are going to perform and stuff like that, it, uh, it becomes something that you are, uh, I mean, I, I laid out so much of the company's marketing plans for the calendar year on Power Sport for that event because we were going to capture so much media. We were going to go get so many rides done. We were going to organize rides, host rides, this, that, and the other. When the when the car started misbehaving a little bit, it uh, we had a plan B, and the plan B was the Pro XP, and then the Pro XP broke that bolt, and I was done. You know, I was done at that point. But the funny thing is, is towards the end of it, for whatever reason, the X3 started running okay. And that, that pinch wire wasn't, wasn't limiting me. Um, but I'm going to answer that question as it pertains to the actual event. Spectacular. Yeah. It was great. You know, they put, they put on another great event. Everyone had a blast. Can't complain. My personal experience at it, it was a little rough, but uh, yeah. it, uh, uh, it wasn't quite as big as 21 where everybody came out of the woodworks from COVID and was like, it doesn't matter what it costs. I'm doing it and I'm going to have a good time doing it. Uh, it wasn't quite that year, but it was definitely a busy uh, event and a lot of people were having a great time there. Um, and I did see that it, it seemed like if I, if I'm looking back at it, like there was less yard sales out on the dunes this year than there was the previous year. And I think that might've been a numbers game. We are laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Not to say that there wasn't a large number. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you. I'll tell you, there's some, there's some interesting stories, man. Like, uh, I was out shooting with uh, reef creative and Russell from buggy whip and the night ride was coming by and I was just like, yeah, I'm going to go. And reef was flying a drone at the time. So he's like, so stoked that the night ride was about to come by. Well, little to little did I know Russell from buggy whip didn't follow me. So I, I just went by myself, like Taylor and I took off and uh, went right to the the furthest north point where everybody stops and waited in line for everybody to go. And so when everybody goes, they take off. Well, Corey, the guy that guys in night ride, took the entire group right by where Russell and Reef were. R Russell's car was parked right in the middle of their trek. So oh, the no. only thing anybody could see were those whips. Those buggy whips. <laughs> well, they all know what a buggy whip looks like well, now. <laughs> if if you've ever seen a UTV takeover night ride, it is what, fifteen to twenty minutes of cars just perpetually blowing by at Mach five? Yep. Can you imagine that? Yeah, like, actually I can. <laughs> oh, were, were you in it? <laughs> well, yeah, they came by us uh, at one point and we we watched them for a little while, so um, and then, you know, obviously I've made videos on it before and stuff like that too. So no, Russell legit told me, he goes, I thought I was dead. <laughs> well, if you're in the middle of it, no, I can't imagine in the middle. Of I can't it. imagine cars being stuck in the middle darting of darting around him. Like how he didn't, how they didn't get hit. I have no clue. Was he even by like a grass knoll or anything? I mean, this isn't like a JFK type situation or, or anything whatever like, you, whatever you call those little grass knobs in the middle. I don't know. But once cars start going by, you're kind of, 
You're well, that's to, what I'm you, saying. You just like, hold on. I can, if I had nothing around me, I would just be butt puckering the entire time. And that's what he did. <laughs> yeah. So gnarly. Yeah. I, I wouldn't wish that upon anyone. <laughs> me, my car was running, finally running semi decent. It would still go into limp mode a little bit, but I knew how to get it out. Just let off the gas for a quick sec and then smash it. So I am literally waiting behind the wheel of my car for Corey to take off. And as soon as Corey takes off, I know I'm the fastest guy. I have the fastest car on that lineup. I go out like a bat out of hell, get right on him. I'm going, I'm going to literally hug this dude's butt for the entire night ride. Boom. Goodbye belt. <laughs> <laughs> have to pull off to the left. Uh, one of Wilkie's friends, Harry hung back and, uh, Harry had more fricking bugle on his X3 than a brass section and came over and <laughs> loaned me a belt. So hopefully he shows up to Utah so I can pay him back for that. But, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, oh, that sucks so bad. <laughs> like I was so bummed. Like, uh, my, my girl was with me and she knew that I was just going to absolutely battle that group something fierce. And dude, that belt blew with inside of a quarter mile. I was so bummed. Yeah. So at uh, takeover, one of the big things for me was being able to do the live streams that we, that we tested out there. And that was a big experiment to see, you know, what's possible, what can we do? And, you know, for me, Starlink was the big, the big question mark was, is, is it possible to take this technology into the dunes or into the mountains or into the wherever and do an actual live stream production of an event or a thing. And yes, it is. And uh, yeah, go no, we, we kind of prove that. Go Elon. <laughs> All we have to do is keep, you know, 10,000 people from surrounding my satellite dish and uh, becoming big bags of water that absorb signal. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we'll keep it. We'll keep it going this next time. Yeah. <laughs> so that was pretty gnarly. We had some uh, pretty big yard sales. Um, oh, shoot, boy. our buddy Brent. With, with the way that car came down in the wind and slapped that I ground, I don't, I don't know, know how he's in one piece. Dude, I don't know how he walked away from my, like, I, I think, um, I think he was on the road homeward bound within a few hours of that happening. And I'm just like, bud, how you doing? Like I checked in on him the next day and he, uh, he was like, I just had to get in my truck and start driving. Otherwise I would have been in so much pain. There's no way yeah. I could have done it. Like I, when, when I, when I saw that happen, I was just like, Oh, you want to talk about a cringe moment? Like you can hurt for somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And a couple people did that. And yeah. So the cars that went big, you know, obviously got yeeted by the wind yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so they, they had a rough day of it. But, uh, then our, our buddy Colton, which we did a build breakdown video with, uh, the day before mm -hmm. it was, very strategic. If anyone's asking, you do the build breakdown before the big event. So that if they yard sale the car, Why? <laughs> yeah. so uh, go check that out. But, uh, but yeah, he had, he had a rough tumble there and walked away from it and walked straight up the sand hill over to where we were sitting. And we had a great discussion about safety and why these cars are built the way they are and, and that it's not just a stock car off the shelf that, yeah. that does these types of huck jumps and stuff like that. Yeah, Ruslan did freaking great. At Dude, his event. RS1 flew oh, perfect. Man, he couldn't get it started. Uh, I think I think it ran out of gas. <laughs> he did. Me. He yeah. ran out of gas. <laughs> but no, I, he, he killed that event. I was so stoked for him. Yeah, no, he did awesome. And then, and then right after that, you know, we had a follow up at Dunefest and, uh, you know, we did basically all the same stuff. Right. And, um, how was that? I know last year Dunefest for you was a big event lots of people there and, and lots of action. Was it the same event this year? Yeah, it was pretty solid. Uh, Dunefest last year, um, uh, was, uh, it was freaking epic this year. I did a little bit different, you know, I just didn't want to basically, not putting that big RV trailer on vendor row. I try to limit the amount of miles it sees cause it's big, it's heavy and it just wears out. Right. That's what RVs do. But, uh, so I did something a little different. I just trailered, trailered one car down and, uh, kind of canoodled around the dunes a little bit. I got to ride with, uh, a number of people, spent a lot of time with Brandon Raddick, spent a lot of time, uh, did a couple of rides with Dave Ehrlich from, uh, EMR factory. Um, Dave was a blast. You know, uh, I hit him up at one point. I'm like, you want to go on a group ride? And he goes, yeah, sure. What time? And we, we got it all set up and I figure it's Dave and maybe three to four of his homies and that's it. Now 30 cars deep. <laughs> and so I take them on the area that I know and w including one downhill through the trees if you are 80 inches, you're not getting through it. Right. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, I, you know that trail. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I, I, I went down through there and then we get back to the lake. And when you got 30 guys that really know how to drive fast, it 
went by really, really fast. <laughs> but I did take him up this one dune into this trail section that would kind of, it's kind of like a track. And we launched off this freaking jump that was just awesome. So much so that I literally had to pull over and watch everybody else in case somebody yard sailed. I was made sure I wanted to see it and laugh. <laughs> um, but then Dave guided us back through the dunes. And I don't know the center of Winchester as good as I probably should just because it changes so much. Like, you know, by day two, day three on a trip there, I'll know it pretty well. But uh, Dave knows it really well. And we probably jumped 12 times. Right. Like, like nice jumps too. And I had such a blast. The only problem is though, as I told Dave before we took off, I'm like, Dave, my car doesn't turn. It's a big power car. Big paddles, big power. We go through a whole bunch of twisties. They better be bermed. <laughs> What's Dave do? <laughs> Flatland turns like left and right all over the place. So I basically have to go around like a freaking aircraft carrier to get my car to come around. And, you know, I don't do like that shift on the fly. Like on the, on the YXC, I could do shift on the fly. Under load, doesn't matter. You right. can pull it in and out of two wheel drive, four wheel drive. It, it didn't care. The X3, I'm a little bit more worried yeah. about, about that front diff. No, you're, <laughs> so, you're slowing down for that big yeah. boy. Or, or I'm just not putting it under load, but, uh, yeah, it, uh, that was, that was, that was a good event. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, my, my girl and I split, split the car and she would take my car out on the dune girls rides. And, uh, yeah, it was just a blast. Yeah, and they uh, they do short course racing, and they do you know a jump competition and all that stuff. And our buddy Chris uh, took his recently refurbished, uh, rebuilt Can Am uh, for a for a tumble, and we we posted that video. So if you haven't seen that, check it out. But once again, another car custom built for jumping for the purpose of safe practice of these things. And you build it for crashing, you don't build it for jumping. And and that was a, another example. Yeah, I, I I was running towards that kid before his car stopped rolling. Shout yeah. out for the dad bod jog out to the sand on that one. Yeah, I, I went out on a sprint and after about 10 steps, I'm like, you better slow it down before you pop a hamstring, bud. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but he once again got out, put his hands up, was for excited sure. and was talking and hugging and, yeah. and no problems there. Uh, I got a chance to go out with the Obsession Boys and, and Matt and those guys and, and film some wheelies and some other content with those guys. So that was a good time. Uh, check check those videos out and there's more to come. You know, and I got to tell you too, like Chris, uh, Chris, the guy that was in the, involved in that wreck, like Chris is basically like family to me and I, I love him to death. But when that happened, I felt more sorry for the work that he put in the car right. than the actual accident uh, where, where I was like, concerned about his safety i knew he was fine like obviously some bumps and bruises and stuff but that thing is a freaking tank and as soon as i got up on him like i stuck my hand through the cab and i grabbed his hand i'm just like if you can hear me and you're okay squeeze my hand and uh he did it right off the bat I'm like we're good yeah, <laughs> yeah and he I, hopped right out i know? had a live stream with him on instagram oh. and uh you know he was basically saying like he barely even felt the first hit yeah it was the one where he was going over the second time where he really actually felt you know, the pressure of the hits. Yeah. Um, and it's a shout out to the harness systems in the seat and, you know, all For the sure. safety components that go into that. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I was absolutely worried that he, uh, that he could have the gotten, worst. That we always could, have the sure, worst. For yeah. sure. That he could have gotten hurt. But in my head, I'm just going, that thing is, and I was telling people too, I'm like, you know, he built this thing the right, the, the right way. But, you know, basically how long we've we been going right now, you oh, know, a little over an hour, a little over an hour. And what, what's the major feedback we get from the, com uh, from the community that we talk about dunes too much. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> we just, we just I, said, I said that on the last I think, yeah. podcast where I was like, yeah, we, uh, we talk about dunes a lot, even though we're mountain guys. <laughs> I know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry guys. Uh, Zach and I haven't had a conversation in a minute. So, <laughs> uh, so anyways, uh, takeover was cool. Dune fest was cool. Um, everybody turned out safe. Everybody went home happy. Uh, except for maybe Brent had a, <laughs> a chiropractic appointment yeah, to make sure. Uh, um, but, uh, yeah, it just, you know, speaks out to how much the industry benefits from these events and how much we benefit from being together and doing these things together. And I can't stress enough that, you know, if you have a UTV and a side by side that you need to be getting out, you need to be having a good time with your friends and making memories and getting out on trail rides and doing stuff where you're pushing your car to the limits and pushing yourself to the limits and having these experiences that you wouldn't otherwise have them. That's why we buy these cars so um got some events coming up we got uh some more racing events happening we got sand sport happening we got sema happening you know what are you uh what are you looking forward to uh Camp no, um i'm looking forward to take over in utah i love sand hollow um i might be going there prior like two weeks before for trail hero which is 
1,600 Jeeps, something like that, and then a bunch of side-by-sides. An ungodly number of Jeeps and a handful of UTVs that piss them all off. Yeah, bring it on. Bring it on. <laughs> they got to catch me. Um, I'm looking forward to take over. Take the FJ over there. I know, right? It's out front. Um, I'm looking forward to take over the most. Um, the The way that we have takeover staffed right now is um, I've got my buddy coming in from Texas. He's like my older brother and then my older sister from Texas as well. And they spoil the absolute crap out of me when we show up at events together. I never have to make a meal. I never have to pay up, pick up a check. I get hugged 15 to 20 times per Are day. Are you trying to speak things into existence here? No, they're coming. <laughs> they're coming. And Because uh, if I can do that too, I want to say uh, all my flights were covered, all my hotel was covered. You, you, you might want to hang out with me in Utah. Like Those two <laughs> are the biggest sweethearts on planet Earth, uh, David and Holly, a couple of my teammates. And um, I just, as long as the rigs hold up and do what I need them to do, with those two there, uh, my girl there, um, her sister, we're going to shoot a bunch of media, have a bunch of fun. And if you've never been to Sand Hollow, find me a more beautiful riding destination ever. It's like wheeling in the Grand Canyon. I just have, I so think I had it's a thought be about, the, about Utah, about, because I was just going to say, as long as the weather's great, it'll be an amazing time. But yeah. then I was thinking to myself, you know, it'd be kind of interesting if it wasn't. Like I, I, oh, that'd be so sick. Like if you consider the riding out there and the views out there, if if they had thunderstorms coming through and some rain and stuff, I can imagine that being an actually really good time if you Dude, were prepped for it. A year and a half ago, they filmed out there for Destination Polaris and they caught a snowstorm. I don't even think it was a year. No, that, half, was, that was this last year. year. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. They caught a snowstorm and I was just incredibly jealous. That yeah. seemed like it would be amazing. So. Yeah, so the the snowstorm that they had, obviously you deal with the cold aspect of it, but if you had like rainstorms coming through and and some of the features on the rocks and the sand and the views and everything else, it would be a, an epic epic trip. Dude, you and I are north, man. The cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's those, true. Those poor little snivelly Cali folks that just had to go deal with the uh, the freaking snow out at Sand Hollow. I'm sure they were just like boo hoo, and I'd be just like, dude, let's rage. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to uh, Dirt Life Media. He was he was out at Dune Fest, and uh, I was rocking sandals and shorts, and yeah, it, like early morning fog was starting to burn off, and it was like I don't know, 69, 70 degrees, something like that, summertime, and. You know, I'm just like, you know, normal summer mm-hmm. and he's over there with a blanket oh, yeah. completely bundled up, just totally shivering. And I was like, bro, we need to get you uh, acclimated. I, I, uh, <laughs> I've gotten to know him a little bit over the last two, two events and just, just killer dude. Like I, I'm, I'm pulling for him. You know, he's, he, the, what he's doing is rad. Yeah. Like I, I'm really stoked for him and I hope it, I hope that it's an upward trajectory. Yeah, no, we all kind of dream of that uh, ability to not be tied down and, and to just go experience, you know, the sport, the industry, the, the country, you know, all of it. And uh, that's what he's doing. So if you, if you enjoy people that uh, have a big personality that enjoy going to UTV events and doing UTV type stuff and racing and, and all that, go, go give him a follow. The thing that I love most about him is he does not care. Like he, <laughs> zero he's, he's like freaking graffitiing his car. The first thing he did oh, when yeah. he bought the Pro R <laughs> was he spray painted it. <laughs> oh, it was so sick. And at uh, at Dune Fest, he's like doing freaking glow in the dark liner around his tires, and he's charging him up in the sun because the night ride is going to be sick. <laughs> yeah. No, he's he's a good he's a good soul, and it definitely is is experiencing life uh, in a way that most of us can't. So yeah, it's cool to catch up with him at those events, man. So, um, and, uh, I'd be kind of, uh, remiss if I didn't bring up the topic of, uh, the big hack at BRP that happened, uh, <laughs> this, this last month and, uh, just take just, it away. <laughs> I don't, I don't really want to spend a ton of time on it, but I think it's important that we all recognize the, uh, the world we live in is so tied down to technology and our digital lives, um, that we live and, uh, you know, think about a scenario where you lost access to all your email, to all your contacts, to all your, um, everything that you do on your phone and computer. If you lost access to all of that, uh, with no hope of getting it back, the pictures, the memories, the emails, everything, um, you would have a pretty rough go at it for the first couple months. And, uh, that's exactly what happened to BRP. So they got they got hit by a, a cyber attack. Um, I'm assuming it's a ransomware, but based off of their actions and the way things have that have played out, 
Um, I've had a number of uh, power sports dealers talking to me about it as far as, you know, the struggles that they're facing, um, the customer service side of that, the struggles that they're facing with the consumers that are upset that their cars are not being um, completed on time, that they're not showing up, they're not being delivered, the parts that they need to fix the parts that broke aren't showing up. They can't even place some orders in some cases. Um, basically BRP got attacked. Their entire infrastructure got put under lockdown because they couldn't do anything. You know, sales reps are hands are tied. They're just making phone calls to people that, that they look up on the yellow pages basically because they don't have any of their contacts. They don't have any of their emails. Um, and it's a rough time for BRP right now. So, uh, and so, so if you are a Can-Am owner or if you're somebody in the industry that's struggling to get, uh, Can-Am parts or place orders or deal with, logistics related to brp um whether that be skidoo whether that be can-am whether that be all, all the different brand power sports brands that they they represent uh give them a break uh give them some time give them some space uh they're basically more frustrated than than us <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh you know there's nothing worse than um having the tools to do your job and not being allowed to do it yeah and uh that's that's the predicament that they're in right now so uh if you're having to deal with a situation related to brp we just uh suggest that you give them some time give them some space give them some leniency and uh look forward to the day when things get back to normal um you know obviously we've gone through COVID. we know what restrictions look like we on uh, supply chain and and all this other stuff you know in this scenario, just give them that little bit benefit of the doubt that they'll get it taken care of. It's just going to take a little bit longer than we all wanted. Right. So anyways, uh, you know, hour and a half show, that's long enough, it's I think. usually how it goes when I <laughs> get together. I try to keep the, the catching up to a minimum. Obviously, we've got a thousand things we could talk about. Well, yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, like when you, when you and I get together, uh, it's usually in five minute windows. Right. Like it usually is very, very fast. And, uh, you and I are both kind of driver personalities where we don't need a lot of information to understand what's happening, but, uh, it's funny. We, we always just catch up on the show. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, you walked into the studio yeah. and we barely talked for uh, 30 seconds. Yeah, before if I, turn, if I turn this camera to show the actual uh, computer monitor that we kind of, you know, he's got information relative to the recording. He's got his window up for his, uh, you know, his Google window up and then he's got screenshots of us. Uh, nowhere in there is a script. <laughs> <laughs> no, we ditched that a long time yeah, ago. For sure. For sure. So now it's good catching up, man. Yeah. No, it's good to see you. Um, I think the last time you were on here, your beard was trying to get a little longer and it, it kind of got bushwhacked there. dude my beard is like uh i mean it's perfection in every way shape and form but like <laughs> if i let it go a little too far i mean you dude oh i'm not even exaggerating like at takeover takeover was so windy and so dirty this year, oh, yeah. especially down in boxcar. One of my coworkers came up and she's like, what is that? Cause like I had a long <laughs> beard. She goes, what is that? And she like grabs it. It was like some balled up hair that I'd picked up from my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> something like that like i had no idea it was in there i don't have like a beard comb or anything and like she pulled it out and by by the time like half that hair was probably mine too but it looked like some yeah it was just oh i i, I let the beard grow like if i was rocking what you had right there they'd probably find jimmy hoffa in it or the cause of covid <laughs> yeah covid would have probably originated in my beard if i grew yeah. on like as big no as there's there's times where things fall out and you don't know where it came from <laughs> So, that's when it's like french fries so uh the family always gives me crap but anyways uh there's a lot of things coming up the, the year's not quite over for a lot of people dune season starting uh for a lot of us we're transitioning into uh cold or wet mountain riding um there's some people that are you know starting to look at putting things away for the winter depending yeah. on how north you are so um yeah things are gonna be changing quickly uh the industry is still moving forward things are still powering through there's a lot of we didn't even talk about some of the consolidation stuff that's been happening oh and some gosh. of the, you know, uh, inner workings of, you know, Super ATV and, and Neville and all these other brands that are just starting to gobble up companies. Um, and then the, the buyout, the half billion dollar buyout of Super ATV, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot we could talk on that one. So uh, if you aren't 
uh, privy to any of the things we're talking about at the moment. Uh, you can always check out the website. You can check out our social media. We cover all the details and news there. Uh, you can follow us on Apple, Google Podcasts, uh, Spotify, all the different places uh, we're available. And if you want to see just how epic my beard is and how much lacking the Ian's beard wants to be like my beard, uh, you can follow us on YouTube uh, anytime. So give us a subscribe and a share and a like and a smash that button for, for Ian's beard. If you like Ian's beard more than mine, give it a subscribe. And if you like mine more, give it a notification bell. How about I'll, that? The only thing that matters is if you break it down by gender. Because <laughs> those females, <laughs> they love a silver fox. I don't know. I've been told people like holding on. So they we'll like, see. Like, they like, <laughs> like gingers. <laughs> so anyways, uh, thanks for following uh, us throughout the summer. Uh, we look forward to this fall and some possible new model announcements uh, at some events. We'll see what happens you there. big tease. And uh, follow us for all the rumors that you love and know from us. So, uh, uh, I think I've slutted this up enough for the social medias and the grams and the tubes. So until the next time, guys, peace. Peace.